Even though I'm full-blooded Chinese, I feel like my family's trajectory has led up to me in a very interesting way. I don't really know much about my family's history and where anyone came from, but I do believe my dad's side comes from Shanghai. Meanwhile, my mom's side, I'm pretty sure, solidly comes from Taiwan. And on top of that, my mom spent some of her early childhood in Guyana in Brazil. Basically, all of that is to say I'm not sure what country this stew recipe comes from. I just know it's an oxtail stew and it's one of two things my mom ever taught me how to make. This and fish. My mom always liked to use the smaller oxtails because she enjoys like chewing on the bones, which I also do. But I changed her recipe a little bit to make it my own and added larger oxtails as well. What I'll do is I'll buy a bag of the smaller oxtails and then I'll pre-cook them in some boiling anise water. Not only does this help soften the bones and the meat a little bit, but that licorice anise aroma will seep into the bones themselves, making them more flavorful as a result. Whether or not you like that licorice flavor that comes from anise, you should know that if you combine that flavor with with cooked onions, what that produces to your brain is very similar to the flavor of cooked beef. This is a Chinese culinary trick that actually makes beef dishes taste even beefier. It doesn't just come from the beef itself, it also comes from these two plants. You can use this trick on mushrooms to give a beefy taste to mushrooms as well. Now for the larger oxtails, since there's quite a bit of meat on there, I will put those at the bottom of my stew pot to sear a little bit while I prepare the rest of the aromatics. It's best to do it all in the same pot because that char that starts at the bottom of the pot from the oxtails, we will use that plus the fat drippings from the tails themselves to cook the onions and garlic later on. You can also add a bunch of other kinds of aromatics as well. I didn't have any on hand, but some dried mushrooms in this would have been nice, maybe some shallots. And if they were in season, I probably would have put some tomatoes in here as well. Now I'm combining the larger oxtails in with the smaller ones and setting them aside just so that I can get an even cook with all the aromatics here. Being it real simple here though, I'm just sauteing the onions and the garlic in the beef fat and the fond. The fond is what we call those charred brown bits that stick to the bottom of the pan when you cook meat or vegetables in it. Yeah, that's the word for that. And even though we're going to add some different spices later on, we are just going to season this with a little bit of salt, white, and black pepper. If you didn't know, white and black pepper are actually parts of the same plant. If you picture black pepper as being like this dark berry that's been allowed to shrivel up and dry up, that's what a black pepper corn is. White pepper is actually the seed that's inside the black pepper and has been allowed to ferment on its own. They have their own distinct flavors and go really well together, but white pepper will get muted a lot more quickly than black pepper, so it's best to grind that fresh. Cumin is one of those spices that requires a little extra time and some heat, so I added that here too. Now, if I were feeling a little French, I would probably have added a splash of dry white wine to the bottom of this pot. I only used chicken stock for this part of the video because I didn't think to do it in any other way, but now that I'm watching it, some sake would have worked really well in this. Add your bouillon of choice to give it a little bit of extra punchy flavor. I like the Likumki brand, but ain't nothing wrong with the Maggie Cuber too. Now, oxtails are a very tough but super flavorful meat, so this point's going to take a little bit of time. You can even do this in a slow cooker and do it up to this step and just like let it go for the rest of the day if you wanted to. I'm prepping my vegetables now, but I won't add them in until the last 45 minutes of the cook because I don't want mushy vegetables in my stew. I prefer them to have a bit of a bite. Of course, you can add whatever it is you want. I did cabbage, potatoes, and carrots. Because we're in Michigan, we're really limited on the fresh, nice vegetables that are available. And in the cold winter, I really just want to go for what's hearty and filling. Now, compared to a lot of the other oxtail stew recipes that are out there, this is a quite mild an herbaceous stew. And if you're used to a Jamaican or a West African oxtail preparation, it might seem a little bit muted to you. So by all means, spice it up in any way you want to make it most comforting to you. We're going to add a little bit of cornstarch slurry here to give it a really nice thick stick to your ribs type texture and quality. You do this when there's only 45 minutes left in the cook. And that's when you also add in the rest of your vegetables as well as a bunch of other spices. Here I put bay leaf, fennel, and some star anise. At this point, your stew should be nice and hearty. You just bring this back up to a boil and then reduce the heat so that it simmers for 45 minutes. I never learned how to make this do until like shortly after I graduated from undergrad. I was only starting to get into cooking at the time and this was like one of the few things that I could make that I felt was like impressive enough to share with other people. Of course, eating this on a big bowl of white rice takes it to another level, but you don't have to do that because of all the other vegetables in here. This stew stands perfectly well on its own. Coming back to the last portion of the side quest, we return to the pork belly that we have been working on for the past three videos. If you have no idea as to what this is, you should go and watch the last two long form videos to catch up. To summarize, I took some leftover pork belly from a different video and I brined it in some pickled chilies for 24 hours, and then I poached it in a master sauce for 10 more hours 
after that. What I'm left with is a gorgeous and flavorful pork belly that has a jiggle that is not unlike a pair of anime titties. The smell was so strong and so gorgeous that not only did it fill up the entire studio, but it permeated into my apartment next door, which brought my dogs over wondering what the hell that was. When cutting into a pork belly roll, it's normally best practice to let it settle and cool for a bit so that it's easier to cut and retains its shape better, but we were really hungry and it was dinner time and there was no more waiting for us in this point. You'll find similarly shaped pork belly at Japanese ramen shops where they make their tasu like this, but instead of distracting from the meat with some noodles and some broth, I just wanted to serve this over some rice with some scallions. Because there was so much work that had gone into the pork itself, I felt like all it needed was just something to counteract the richness and the fattiness of it. I'll tell you right now, it was a good decision because the pork was almost overwhelming when it comes to flavor. There was a fermented funk in the meat from the duo jiao that I had put it in, but then the soy sauce, the sugar, the herbs, and the spices in the top layer where it came in contact during the braise was really strong as well. As far as experimentation goes, this was entirely successful. I especially enjoyed brining the meat in the duo jiao, the pickled chilies, and I think I'm gonna try that again with chicken before frying it.